everyone, good evening. We are very pleased to bring you a gentleman tonight who is a member of an immigrant family from Detroit. He earned a bachelor's degree from University of Detroit in history and also a master's degree in history from Wayne State University. And he earned an education specialist degree in instructional technology and library science from Wayne State. He wrote three, three books on local history, including one on tonight's subject, and he has been a teacher in the Detroit public schools or other schools, and he was an adjunct professor at Macomb Community College. Please welcome Armando Delicato. Um, well, thank you for coming. Um, many of you Italian, of the time you say, oh, a fair number. Uh, but uh, let me, we, as a preface, say what we went through, that is Italian immigrants, is not totally different from what other immigrant groups have done throughout the history of the United States, uh, even to this very day when we have immigrants coming from the Middle East, from uh, Bangladesh, uh, from Mexico, uh, who are going through much of the same uh, accommodation that had to happen in my case to my parents or to grandparents of many people. The Italian American population of Metro Detroit could be as high as 400,000. Uh, but then so, uh, you think the polls have something like six, seven, eight hundred thousand. Why is it so uh, uh, varied? Because the next generation is almost always mixed. My grandson has six different nationalities. Uh, as do my various nephews and nieces. So we've, we have assimilated. And what we'll see in the case of uh, uh, Italian immigration in Detroit, that things have changed considerably over the years. Uh, one thing I might uh, uh, point out a few things that make us, that is Italians, if I say us, Italians are pretty open. We love to have uh, people who aren't naturally Italian too. Uh, I had a, a cousin visit from Italy uh, years ago and we went to a store and the, he only spoke Italian and the woman, for some reason, he thought she was Italian and when uh, he said something to her, she was overjoyed and she, had, she didn't know what he was saying exactly. But uh, uh, Italians have changed. It's interesting because, of course, a hundred years ago it was a very different story. And uh, uh, we won't dwell on the past too much uh, in terms of negatives, but there was a time when uh, terms like Dago and WAP were common and they weren't spoken in, in, in a pleasant, positive way, but rather as a pejorative uh, that some other groups uh, are experiencing today. Uh, 1920s, the uh, United States government passed a quota system law that restricted Italians to 5,600 immigrants a year. Now that in the context of from 1880 to 1920, in 40 years, 4 million Italians came to live in the United States or came as immigrants. Uh, there was a, a big fear that we were going to ruin American democracy and uh, uh, that we would never be able to really fit in. Uh, they were wrong. Uh, I think that uh, you'll see as we go through the slideshow that uh, Italians have assimilated uh, quite fully. Uh, so uh, it, it was a struggle for the, the, the original immigrants, I should say the early immigrants. Uh, one other thing uh, before we start with uh, the images is uh, I will point out there's three separate periods of Italian immigration. Um, from 1880 to 1920, was uh, the real big influx. That's when most of the immigrants were poor, uh, uneducated farm workers in Italy, mostly uh, sharecroppers who owned, didn't own land and who lived in a feudal society where they were at the bottom of the, the social heap, so to speak. Uh, they are the ones that probably, are you, if you see movies or TV shows, uh, it's them that are portrayed. They're usually Southerners, but not entirely. Uh, they talk with a slight accent, usually New Jersey accent for some reason. Uh, this is the Sopranos, uh, and uh, all of the, um, 
uh, mafia movies seem to be people from New York or New Jersey, uh, which I was always grateful for because that left us a little off that loop. Um, but they, uh, uh, the, the, this particular, that particular group is the one we most associate Italian immigrants in the United States with. And they are the ones, um, my family were the very tail end of that particular immigration. Uh, and, and it's a very different one where the parents spoke Italian, they had a, an accent, where the parents, in fact, didn't really speak Italian, the, uh, they spoke a dialect. Until 1860, Italy was a series of countries, little countries or uh, parts of other countries, um, and Italians generally spoke the dialect of their particular region. And I, as a boy, there was a TV show, I'm sorry, there wasn't a TV show yet, there was a radio show uh, the, that uh, Ilio Benvenuti uh, was, oh no, uh, let's see, there was a couple of others, but it doesn't matter. They, they would speak and play music, and I would hear the speaking and wonder why I didn't understand them, but they were speaking proper Italian, which is quite different than the various dialects, and uh, rather difficult to learn for, uh, for those of us who are in America. In fact, Italian scholars have come to study d Italian dialects in America because they, it's, they uh, uh, continue to be used here more even than in Italy where people started to get proper education and they had television and they, uh, most people in Italy now speak uh, proper Italian. Or if they don't speak it at home, they at least know it. So the first immigrant group, 1880 to 1920, after the uh, quota system, there's a, a dry period. And then in the 30s, of course, with the Depression, and then in the early 40s, World War II, which presented another issue. Very few people came uh, to the United States from Italy then, at least not voluntarily. So they were prisoners of war, but we'll get to them in a minute. Um, that era is a uh, kind of a quiet one. Immediately following World War II, uh, the, the refugees, people who had lived through the war in Italy, who had to get out because of the enormous damage done, uh, and especially if they had family here in the U.S. So there's another group who are a little bit different than the first group. They are lucky because group number one is able to help them to bridge the the, the cultural change that they were experiencing. Number two, Benito Mussolini is a, it's a very interesting person and era. Uh, one good thing he did was insist on education so that the second group are far more likely to speak proper Italian or at least know it. And they have some education and they tend not to settle in the old neighborhood and I'll show you in a minute where all of those were. Uh, that lasts until the late 60s, early 70s, when the economic miracle in Italy ends economic uh, immigration. And then in, uh, at that point until the present, what we find that people who are coming to live here from Italy are coming here because they've married an American, or they're transferred here on business, or they own property here that, in other words, uh, sort of an equality finally appears. And we'll see that today uh, for those from people who lived through the old days, it's amazing to think uh, Italians own Chrysler. And there are buildings all over the industrial suburbs of Italian companies that have a presence here. Uh, and people think that, oh my God, we're like Germans now because we uh, we're prosperous and we're important in uh, international um, uh, economics. So uh, just in a couple of other items that might be different. People did, people from Poland, from Ireland, from Germany, in many cases left because of political reasons, for freedom from an oppressive government or for freedom of religion. Uh, very few, if any, Italians came here for freedom of religion. Almost all of them were Catholic, and in Italy uh, that was no problem. Uh, during Mussolini's period, very few people came, not many to Detroit because they were opposed to Mussolini. They, uh, Mussolini refugees generally stayed in Europe hoping to overthrow him. So what we'll see, there, there's a, a difference there as well. So what we'll look at some of the slides, um, get an idea of the group that came to live here in Detroit and how 
uh, they adjusted and how they were able to assimilate and, uh, and uh, the differences that we see here, the, the impact they've made on this particular community of Southeast Michigan. Uh, just, I threw this in to show why they left. <laughs> this woman uh, probably has four, five, six children living in a house that is not what anything we would consider. Um, well, when I went to Italy the first time, uh, I was 21, I graduated from college, and I said to my father, why did you leave this wonderful place? And he said, it wasn't like that then. And this, this I, I think, symbolizes for me why uh, so many immigrants were willing to leave. And that this is ships leaving uh, the port of Naples, which carried the majority of those four million uh, people back in the day. This is uh, really early, of course, with sailboats that would take a very long time to cross the Atlantic. Uh, obviously, uh, transportation improved quite a bit as time went by. I just want to point out in Detroit, uh, downtown, of course, Gratiot, this, this street, and that's really the center of the old immigration, immigration from period number one. Um, immediately to the east of where the Chrysler Expressway is today uh, was the beginning of Little Italy, if you will, and it rode up Gratiot. We replaced the Germans who actually settled there first and built most of the community. Uh, as they moved further out, uh, the Italian immigrants and some others moved into their place. Then uh, by, the, by the early 1900s, as the city started to really grow and industrialize, uh, they moved up. This is the Ford Freeway, I-94, and right over right there, there's a neighborhood called Cagalupo that uh, was sort of the second Little Italy, major Little Italy. Little Italy. And then as uh, by the 50s, the, the explosive growth meant that uh, the next generation were moving into the suburbs. There were some going on the west side here, uh, down and off of Dearborn, a little uh, community. Uh, you could tell where there were five Roman Catholic churches. Uh, Our Lady of Mount Carmel was uh, mostly northerners, especially from San Marino, a little country within Italy. Um, not, a, not a major little Italy, but, uh, but it just shows that they, there was a spread. And around Highland Park, and adjacent to Hamtramck, we see uh, these communities growing. Uh, the center of the community, uh, especially in the early, well, not even especially, in the early uh, community, which generally centered around a church. And that's typical, I think, of all of the immigrant groups. Uh, even people who weren't particularly religious back in their homeland, when they have moved to a strange place, find that uh, the religion is probably one of the the institutions that still hold them together. So what we find, uh, again, oddly enough, with all of the Italians that came here, there were only five uh, Italian parishes, Catholic parishes. There were small Protestant groups who had, uh, where pe some people had uh, converted, but uh, this was uh, a San Francisco church near Eastern Market, and uh, it had a school, uh, and uh, that would be right across to the right of that. San Francisco now exists still, but it exists on uh, uh, Metro Parkway near Grosbeck. Uh, they brought with them in, in, uh, uh, from their villages back in Italy, and particularly in the south, where uh, religious festivals are celebrated in, uh, outside with parades and processions. And uh, this would have been the Feast of the Assumption, August 20, August 15th, in, I believe, uh, this picture was taken in 1940, uh, when immigration had just pretty much ended, but uh, most of the people in the Italian community were still people who remembered the old country and the old ways. Uh, the other church, the, also known as the Sicilian Church, is Holy Family, right on I-75 and back of the Blue Cross building downtown. It still exists in the same location. Uh, I understand that the Sicilian community 
is particularly strong in maintaining this particular church. They imported a priest from Italy, from Sicily, uh, and they even considered moving the building. They didn't want to tear it down and get another one like San Francisco. San Francisco didn't tear the church down on purpose. The city condemned it to build the I-75 and expand the market. Uh, this one, they actually considered rolling it down to the river, putting it on a raft, and bringing it up through Mount Clemens and the, the uh, Clinton River to, to what's now really, if there is a center of Italian community, uh, it's there. It turned out it wasn't a good idea. But it's still uh, uh, quite a, an important church. Uh, interesting little side notes. A uh, few of the Sicilians seem to have been involved in some activities that would draw the ire of the FBI. And what they've done, and still do I understand, right in front of it is I-75. On the other side of the freeway are um, apartment houses in Lafayette Park. They have a permanent roost on one of the roofs where they take pictures of funerals and weddings because there are certain ones that apparently would attract um, people that uh, they are interested in. Uh, so still exists, still going strong. Uh, and then just one example, St. Elizabeth is on McDougall at near, uh, it's just, just east of Eastern Market. This is where I was baptized and went to the first grade, so I chose this picture to symbolize all of the others. What Italians tended to do was join the neighborhood Catholic Church. So uh, St. Elizabeth was built by German immigrants in the 19th centuries, and um, uh, as Italians moved in, it became an overwhelming, predominantly Italian church. Immediately to the north of it was a Polish parish, St. Hyacinth, which is still operation. This is still operating, although I don't think there are many Italians in it any longer. Um, but uh, this is the old east side. Uh, people came to Detroit uh, for industry and for jobs. And especially after 1900 when the auto industry is uh, booming here. Uh, many Italians worked for the auto companies, but a, a fairly large percentage did not. And particularly people who came from Sicily who found working in a factory too confining and uh, too depressing uh, went into other fields and one of them was uh, groceries. If you go to Eastern Market today and drive around on the fringes, the wholesale companies, Mosseri, and um, I can't remember right the Smith and all the name, but predominantly Italian names on these large uh, wholesalers of food. So Grandpa started out back in the early 1900s, uh, and uh, his son and grandson, and now of course it would be also his granddaughters, because times have changed, uh, are, are still very involved. So the first ones would often buy food at the market, load their wagon, this is probably pulled by a horse, and then go up and down the streets selling fruits and vegetables to the housewives in the days before freezers and even before refrigerators. Uh, to, so, and people would come out and buy their uh, food from them. Again, their ancestors, their descendants, are, uh, are now running these major companies. Uh, many of the other Italians, my father included, worked in construction. Uh, they were outside building roads, building houses. Uh, in the early 1900s, the city is explosive growth, where we're doubling in population for the first three decades, each decade, the first three decades of the 20th century. Uh, these men are probably all Italian, although, uh, and they would be uh, digging digging before a steam shovel and uh, doing a lot of the paving and other construction work which would include uh, working uh, bricklaying and cement making and so forth. So that in, in effect, I think you could easily say honestly that Detroit is built to a large extent, at least in that era, by Italian immigrants. Um, another uh, source of income or source of jobs would be uh, uh, landscaping work, work, working outside again. That was a preference for people who had lived on farms in Europe. These men are all of Italian descent and they're all from a town called Casino, Italy, south central. Uh, they worked at Cranbrook. 
Cranberg Institution up in on Woodward and uh, Long Lake area. Uh, the the uh, owners, the, the scripts and the booths wanted these Italians because they were very good at what they did and they were very hard workers and uh, they appreciated their, their, uh, their dedication. Um, to a much smaller extent, uh, Italians were attracted to the arts. Now we all know Italy and art are almost synonymous. Uh, not that there aren't artists everywhere else as well, uh, but many of the of artists, uh, the great art of the world, they say something like 40% of the major art in the world is either in Italy or done by Italians. So it's been a big deal since the time of the Renaissance, in fact, actually from the time of the Romans. Um, so there were a few uh, men, particularly, who would be involved in creating things of beauty that weren't necessarily necessary for uh, to, to eat or drink. One of them is a man named Corrado Parducci. Corrado Parducci is an incredible sculptor. He did bas-relief. There's something like 600 examples of his work in the United States, most of them in Detroit where he lived. This is the Guardian building. And you see uh, these, these Art Deco, the, all of this uh, design is, is designed by him. He didn't necessarily individually uh, work every chisel. He had people who worked for him too, but uh, it made an enormous impact on, on the beauty. Uh, we got a new documentary on that was just made last year called Corrado Parducci, the man who made Detroit beautiful. And he did downtown. They had uh, walking tours of Corrado Parducci's work downtown. Something for your group to consider when the weather changes again. Um, this is the Trinos, they are the fellow, he was you know, the, the straw boss, if you will, at Cranbrook and was honored by the, uh, the, the, the Cranbrook community for his service in doing the landscape there. So then we'll go back downtown. This, again, we're still in that first period of Italian immigration. This is Gratiot Avenue looking north in the 1920s. Um, Obviously, the street has changed quite a bit. Uh, during the 30s, during the Depression, the federal government, to make work, uh, gave a lot of money for public work, so they widened Woodward uh, and Gratiot and Michigan Avenue and some of the other major streets. But uh, none of this is left, unfortunately. Um, it was really actually a little, uh, this would be Little Italy if, if it had really survived. Uh, it, it would be a place where you could go and like Catramic is now for the Poles. Uh, nobody lives there, really lives there anymore, but uh, it's a commercial center that's got the charm from the old, olden days. This, interestingly, is looking the other way toward downtown, and every building you see is still there. Uh, on the left, where it says uh, Seuss, I can't see. Silius. Well, it's a furniture store anyway. Uh, it's now artist lofts. The whole street, that whole block now, are restaurants and galleries. Uh, the building just at the corner is in the process of being converted into apartments. But more importantly for the Italian uh, history, this building, you can see you, the pole is in the way, Lombardi Foods. Back before the 1950s, uh, I recall that my mother had to go down there to get many of the olive oil or some of the pastas because uh, it wasn't widely known. Today, of course, you can get Italian food basically anywhere. Um, but uh, but uh, times have changed and that, that's an example of it. Directly next to it, Grash's Central Market was uh, and is uh, a market with uh, several meat stores, fish stores within the building. And then in back of it is Eastern Market, a major source of food and wholesale of food in the Detroit area. Uh, one of the very few buildings left from that era is uh, the Roma Cafe, and it's in Eastern Market vicinity, uh, just to the north of the market itself, uh, still open. It started out as a rooming house for farmers uh, it was bought by an Italian family uh, who uh, the upstairs was fed, so the farmers in the old days 
would be coming in on horses and wagons and they would come the night before to set up for their Saturday sales and they would be able to rent out a bed for the night. Then uh, the, hot the hotel was closed and the, it's the oldest continuously operating restaurant I believe in Michigan, but certainly in Southeast Michigan in this era, and it still is. Um, I interviewed them for my book ten years ago, and uh, I don't know, have you, who's eaten there? Uh, they said, well, we don't cook for Italians, we cook for Americans. <laughs> uh, I think they had a wedge of iceberg lettuce for salad. <laughs> Where did that come from? But. Uh, but it's it's very popular, obviously, and uh, still still thriving. A third generation worth. Okay, here uh, you see another example: horse and uh, wagon of food, uh, vegetables and fruit carts that would go through the city uh, in a day when housewives had to buy food every day or every other day because it would spoil if without. Here's a, a family, a family from the Genoa area in northern Italy celebrating a baptism. Uh, they're all, of course, uh, in a good mood and they notice the, the way they're dressed. Uh, now, nowadays they'd be in t-shirt and shorts, but uh, they, these people are fresh, uh, well, probably pretty fresh from, uh, from the old country and are still pretty formal in their attire for this particular uh, event. Uh, this is a funeral cart. There are two major Italian funeral homes in Detroit, Calcaterra and uh, Bagnasco. Calcaterra is from the very northern part of Italy. Bagnasco is from Sicily. Uh, they merged <laughs> and uh, are now uh, merged not only with each other, but parts of them have merged with other companies. Calcaterra is a Polish and Italian origin, but they, of course they're not, uh, they're not exclusive anymore. Uh, this is in front of the San Francisco church, that first picture that we saw. Uh, as uh, he, the uh, Calcaterra was trained by a man named Haas who had a funeral home and he was German and serviced the German community. And as the Italian community got bigger, uh, he trained uh, Calcaterra so that uh, uh, he would go into business himself and has moved. I think they now have four or five funeral homes scattered on the, on the east side in Macomb County. Uh, this is always interesting to me too. Uh, the first Italians in Detroit came with Cadillac in 1701. Number two in command was a man named Alphonse Tonti, uh, T-O-N-T-Y. Uh, that of course was a name change. His real name was uh, Al Al Alfonso Tonti with a, in the in an I. Uh, his wife gave birth to a girl in 1702 and was thus the, the first European descended uh, child born in, uh, in Michigan. Um, I can't imagine them doing this <laughs> with that particular sign anymore. But uh, uh, again, this was in, 19, in 1951 when Detroit was 250 years old. The old tech neighborhood, unfortunately, like so much of the rest of Detroit, has deteriorated quite a bit. Uh, but, uh, but some blocks still have the old houses. There, I don't believe there are any Italians left. One of the interesting things, though, here, I took this picture a few years ago, you see the fence right up to the sidewalk. Uh, Italian, that's urban farming business is nothing new. Uh, the Italian immigrants thought, what's with grass? You can't eat it. We don't have any animals to graze on it. So they would uh, pretty much take over whatever property they had and grow something useful like tomatoes or peppers, uh, etc. Okay, a big issue and something we shouldn't ignore. During the 1924, Benito Mussolini takes over the Italian government. And uh, for better or for worse, he's in there until 1943. Uh, Interestingly, his first decade or so, he's very popular in the United States. He brought order to Italy, the trains ran on time, he made people go to school, children, send their children to school. Uh, unfortunately, he was also a warmonger and brought enormous destruction to Italy as well. But in the early days, he's really quite popular. 
Uh, this is New York Times in 1934, uh, lauding him for his contributions to Italy. They're going to sing a very different tune, of course, as time goes by. Uh, here you see young boys being trained by the fascists, uh, but not in Italy, oddly enough. This is taking place here in Detroit. Um, he was popular among the immigrants. In fact, many of the older people, the generation that knew uh, Italy in his day were really quite pleased with it until the war, of course, and uh, the fact that he declared war on the United States and that there's a whole other issue that comes up then. So uh, war comes 1941, uh, Mussolini declared war on the U.S. before we declared war on him. Uh, they did very poorly in the war, to put it mildly, and many Italian soldiers in North Africa were captured, and rather than set up camps out there where they weren't sure that all those troop ships coming across the Atlantic would bring the American troops to Europe and North Africa, could, instead of going back empty, would be loaded with German and Italian prisoners of war, the very lucky ones who got to come here and be fed and live fairly comfortably, as opposed to uh, prisoners of the other side, who of course were uh, mistreated, and also with the shortages of food, they weren't going to give the prisoners of war uh, a lot of it. So then war is over and people started to return to normal. And here in Detroit, this Mrs. Rossi is on the extreme left and her two friends, and they have uh, they are not living down in the Gratiot area. They live off of uh, Livernois and Davison area, uh, as many of the second rung people are doing. Um, the Barbarito family uh, live on the east side, Warren and Van Dyke area. This is the wedding of their daughter, uh, the son-in-law, uh, the fellow in the tux, ultimately takes over. Bomberito Bakery is still open. It's on Mac, just north of 8 Mile. Uh, and this, I think I even have a picture of it still coming up. Uh, also, I mentioned 4 million people came here, but many of them returned to Italy, changing the Italian society quite radically too. People who had come here and experienced American life and that went home were not willing to go back to doffing the hat and sticking off the sidewalk when the nobility or the wealthy persons walked by. And as a result, they, people were able to buy property and develop a, a, a sort of a lower middle class in Italy. This is a, the daughter of one of those immigrants. Uh, this is in probably around 1949 or 50. Um, they actually had cars, which in those days in this particular town, would, that would have been quite unusual. And, uh, but again, he, he, the father of the bride, is quite well off because of his years here in Detroit where he earned uh, a good living and was able to buy a large piece of property that he could farm and support his family with. Uh, during this period, we still find families anxious to maintain the traditions of the past. These women are making chamela. It's a, every part. Of, you go ten miles in Italy, and they have a different food uh, specialty of the house. Uh, these women are a part of a group at a church who are making uh, traditional Italian food for a festival, and probably even to sell. Uh, one of the better ones was making wine. Uh, up until probably 30 years ago, uh, it was very common. Uh, the men from immigration group number one and number two uh, would very often still make their own wine because number one, they knew what went into it, is what I heard all the time. Uh, and you never know what someone's bottling. And uh, secondly, is they like they like their own product. And so we, we see, uh, have seen much less of that now, although they're still in the fall. You can buy grapes at 4th Street down in Detroit near the Ambassador Bridge, and a few people still do it, but, but it's, it's really dying out pretty quickly. Um, these people are making sausages, also very typical. Uh, a lot of family events centered on food and uh, on the preparation of food. and. Uh, uh, it's, it's a, it was something they did because they liked what they, the product and they also did it because it usually was a social event that you did with other family members. Um, these boys, of course, are 
reenacting an old way of making wine that's just uh, not really used any longer, but uh, apparently in a hundred years or so and beyond, uh, that was fairly common. During uh, the 1930s, I'm jumping back and forth a little here, uh, Detroit is, and the American Italian community is starting to become more sophisticated and more assimilated. This is uh, uh, Mr. Coppola, Francis Ford Coppola is a famous American uh, movie uh, director, producer, etc. This is his dad. He, grew, he was born in Detroit. The reason his name is Francis Ford is his father during the uh, depression worked for a Ford Motor Company uh, who sponsored a the Detroit Symphony on the radio out of Orchestra Hall in Detroit. So he was so thrilled that he was able to practice his music and get paid that he named his, gave his son the middle name Ford. Um, the, the Gaylords, another major group in Detroit back in the 40s, 50s, um, the little Little Shoemaker and uh, uh, the, all kinds of number of uh, top hits in the hit parade before rock and roll uh, uh, changed everything. Although after rock and roll, there were plenty of young Italian, many of the 1960s musicians, not necessarily Detroit ones, but uh, all over who uh, made it big. Johnny Desmond was another one. You have to be a certain age to remember Johnny Desmond, but he he was uh, Giovanni di de, Desmondi de Desmondi. It was uh, they changed his name. Uh, he, they had a grocery store on Gratiot near Harper, and uh, a radio um, Detroit one of the D Detroit stations walked through, and he was working in his family store in his early teens and singing, and he thought he had such a great voice. He called the parents and said, "You got to." Uh, promote this kid to uh, to use his voice and to share his voice and so they changed his name to Johnny Desmond uh, remember again World War II is just ended Italians weren't the most popular people yet uh, uh, in, in America although that, that changes pretty rapidly here uh, Aldo Chicago conducted the Detroit Symphony Orchestra in the 1960s for a while I, I guess get an example of the, the breadth of the community as it starts to grow, as it starts to grow older, and as it starts to develop uh, more generations who are able, as Americans, to uh, utilize the, the, uh, the advantages of being American to uh, become better educated, to express their culture, and so on and so forth. The Italian colonial band was a marching band type uh, who, who were very involved in the Italian community and during doing uh, important festivals and so forth. Back in 1943, uh, there was a horrible race riot in Detroit. Dr. Herata de Herodes was an Italian immigrant doctor who uh, they made house calls in those days and they were warned not to enter certain neighborhoods if you were white and if you were black not to enter other certain neighborhoods. He went in, uh, he said, my patients need me and uh, was brutally murdered. During, by 1950, uh, the Italian community is recovering from World War II and from the humiliation of their country of origin having declared a war, and they, they are becoming a little bolder in terms of being part of this community. This monument was put up at Gratiot, Warren, and East Grand Boulevard to Dr. Herodas. Uh, it still exists, although it's been woefully neglected. And uh, the other sad thing about the Italian community is it's very difficult to get them to work together uh, to deal with issues like this, but uh, more on that in a minute. Uh, the big uh, advantage after World War II for Detroiters was that Windsor in Canada did accept uh, thousands of Italian immigrants so that uh, Little Italy, Erie Street, and uh, east side of Windsor is the center of a thriving community to this day. Uh, lots of restaurants and stores, although their community is assimilating the same as that in Detroit. It's just a, it's a generation later. Uh, so the wonderful restaurants uh, and still some sense of Italian culture. It's a smaller community and it may be one of the reasons. This was a bicycle race in front of their parish church of St. Angela. Uh, Sorrento Cafe still exists, although it has a different name now. Uh, this was uh, the Chochara Club, people from the 
region between Naples and Rome. Uh, there's a, 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 a shrine outside of the town of Canedo, and they rebuilt an exact duplicate of it for the benefit of these immigrants. So then in 1982 or three, Italy won the World Cup. Uh, nothing in Detroit, unless you knew somebody, there was no central place to go except in Windsor. And this is a street, as soon as they win the, won the game, this street erupts into uh, rapturous uh, happiness. Uh, uh, we used to have the, um, um, uh, the, the ethnic festivals downtown. Uh, this is a group that were recreating Roman, uh, Roman centurions. Uh, Alcamo's is an example. Many uh, food stores and restaurants. Bomarito Bakery uh, on the west side in St. Clair Shores. Uh, the only, the closest we come to a little Italy, and it's pathetic if, if you think of it as a little Italy, is this strip mall along Garfield near 18 Mile Road, where there's a couple of stores. Uh, and each of those strip malls will have a store or two that caters. But uh, there's, the charm rate is, is zero, maybe even negative. Uh, except some. Now, San Grimo, the San Marino Club, on uh, Maple Road, constructed a clubhouse that resembles the palace in San Marino. Uh, some, this fellow, Vittorio Mieli, is a cousin who came to visit. Uh, and the, what we see in the latter part of the 20th century and into the 21st is back and forth, where people, uh, Italians, can now afford to actually come and visit their relatives here and vice versa. Uh, the Columbus Day celebration, October 12th, coming up, I believe, uh, they, could, they have a parade down Romeo Plank. Again, we really envy the Poles who can still go back to Hamtramck in an interesting neighborhood that has historical uh, traditions for them. Uh, this, it's not very popular because it's, it's in the wrong place at the wrong time, but at least they keep trying. Uh, this, uh, this is Mrs. Capaldi uh, organized Italian groups. This was a, a group that went on a pilgrimage into Quebec. There are clubs for the various regions of Italy. Uh, these are artists, except for me. I was just in charge of the IT at that particular one. But these are Italian, people of Italian descent, Americans of Italian descent, who were artists that were involved in an uh, exchange with uh, Torino in Italy. In Detroit, and then uh, the uh, on the west side, Cantoral Market, something to the pretty much like Papa Joe's, only it's all Italian uh, food in uh, a very large store. Pretty much, though, if you go to Papa Joe's, you you get the you get the picture. And then last but not least, Fiat Chrysler uh, symbolizes this last group of of immigrants have virtually nothing to do with the descendants of the early immigrate, immigrants because they're, no, they're not really from the same culture. The Italian-Americans uh, can relate to one another because they, they or their parents or grandparents experienced American culture in a different time. The ones who come now are usually well-educated and they'll live in Birmingham or Bloomfield Hills or uh, uh, Rochester, a lot of them because of Chrysler being nearby. Uh, a, a different, uh, quite different, and so with little in common basically with, with the immigrants from the olden days. Um, I think I'm just done. I did it. <laughs> uh, if you have any questions or comments. Yes, yes. Yes, Cacalupo has two possible origins. One, um, there's a the streetcar on grass. See, the early immig earliest immigrants, 1910, their children are moving out up to Harper and Gratiot. And uh, the old guys back on McDougal and Gratiot are saying, why should I come all the way out to where the streetcar turns? So Cacalupo, the loop, the streetcar loop, used to be at Harper. More likely, is the same old guys that said it meant. Um, you may probably know what kaka means. Uh, Lupo is a wolf, and they would say, why should I go way out into the woods 
where the wolf is defecating. <laughs> so <laughs> that's uh, that's the origin of that. Uh, but I, I'm inclined to think it's number two rather than literally. Lombardi <laughs> foods. Yeah. We had Lombardi foods out here at one time. It was on 23 Mile Road. Yeah, for a while they, they had uh, satellites. There was one in Madison Heights or Warren. I remember there was a, they had several. But I think uh, probably the descendants of the Lombardi family either got tired of it or the national, the, just uh, the, the uh, major corporations take over. It's no longer necessary to go anywhere but Kroger's or uh, uh, any neighbor and store is going to sell olive oil and pasta and uh, so on and so forth. Any other? neighbor some years ago whose dad came over here in the first wave of immigrants and he would go, he was working for Ford, quote unquote, they went out every day and waited and the foreman would say, okay, you, 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 and you, and if they weren't chosen that day, they didn't have the income for their family. Yeah, all workers, uh, before unions, uh, workers really suffered and uh, I think any of us grandparents or great-grandparents uh, would have not led the kind, would be amazed to see the life that we're living here in Rochester or in Oakland County or, or so forth uh, compared to the, the olden days. Uh, I did, one other thing I had to mention is the, the language. Uh, I, when I lived, when I was very little, we lived on the east side at Gratiot near Warren. And uh, everybody, uh, everybody spoke a different language at home. It was a not necessarily the same one. The kids all spoke English. Uh, most of uh, many of us were Italian, but uh, my parents' friends were from the Limac, which is about halfway up to um, Venice, and they would speak to each other in broken English because the dialects that they normally spoke were incomprehensible to one another. And so, and that's been a, a, an issue for the Italian community more so than for. For example, the, the Germans or the Poles, where they really had such distinct languages uh, that uh, it, it made it difficult to form a, 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 an Italian community. Most of the clubs in the Detroit area still are regional clubs. Like you saw a picture of the Calabria Club or the Sicilian Club, so people from a particular town, uh, as opposed to the, the ones that are going to be all encompassing. Uh, they exist as well. But it's an issue that the Italian community uh, has a real problem dealing with. Yes? Was it a problem for some of them that if they had children, they wanted their children to speak English, and therefore they were not taught? In every, I think every ethnic group that came here, there's a battle. Um, in the old, that first group, Women were in Italy until Mussolini didn't, weren't required to go to school. And so generally the mother would speak Italian or her particular dialect. The father, because he worked outside of the home, often could speak English. But uh, the early days, people did learn their dialect. They passed that on to their children. But as TV and uh, the dispersal of the community, uh, I to, that, that changed uh, a fair amount. But yes, for a lot, of, if you've ever tried to teach a child another language, uh, it's, it's unless the people I know, and they're not necessarily Italians, who had, who were immigrants who want their child to know not just English, but the language of origin, uh, generally one of the parents will insist that they only speak to the child in that language. Because the minute the, the mother, for instance, starts to speak English to the child, and the father does too. It's all over. They'll know a few words. But uh, uh, I have a friend who's uh, German-Swiss, and she refused to ever speak to her children in, in English because she said that uh, that would, you know, that she wanted them to know her language as well. Yes. Just a quick question. Years ago, I worked with a gentleman who was Italian who said that his family, I believe, owned a mushroom farm on the east side somewhere. Could be. Uh, yeah. And that they would put up nets 
to catch birds in flight, and then at the end of a period of time, a week or whatever, the mother would make soup from the birds that were caught. Okay, once again, if you go back enough, we we're just talking about factory workers who were chosen by the day. Uh, there never used to be, they never had to worry about uh, a garbage day. Uh, maybe if you, even the bones would be used to make soup. They couldn't afford to throw away any part. The chicken's feathers were used to make mattresses or pillows. It was, uh, yeah, I think that, that's fairly common among Italians and among people from other nationalities as well. They, you know, they would use it. used to say the only thing the pig that was left was the oink. Um, well, thank you for coming. Um, Uh, if you're interested in, I wrote one on Cork Town if you're Irish, or Mexican, or Maltese, uh, and of course Italians in Detroit. They're Arcadia books, mostly pictures. They're $22 normally, 20 and uh, no tax if you're interested. They're up here, or if you just want to look at them. I think they may even have them in the library. Um, but uh, please help yourself to look at them, and if you're interested, I'd be glad to sign them. So thank you.